when they came to a place called the skull. They nailed him to a cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. As we begin our spoken series, Seven Sayings on the Cross, leading up to Easter, I want us to remind ourselves and keep in the forefront, forefront of that mind two things. One, I want us to keep in our mind during the whole series. And then the second thing I want us to keep in the forefront of our mind tonight. Number one, after he was arrested and wrongly accused and made fun of, mocked, ridiculed, after he was punched in the face repeatedly, kicked in the ribs, hit in the back, after he was betrayed by his best friends. After he was whipped with a cat of nine tails that ripped the flesh from his back, sides, chest, and stomach. After a crown of thorns was slammed on his head, some of those thorns being three inches long. Could you imagine? After someone put a robe over his back, then later on ripped that robe off, reopening all the wounds. After he was forced to carry a cross up a hill after enduring this. After they nailed huge stakes in his hands and feet. Lifted him up on that cross, slamming the cross into the ground, probably uh, disconnecting every joint in his body. After all that, the first thing our Savior says is forgive them. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. We need to be reminded of that during this series because it's the reason why we do everything. It's the reason why we get to do everything. The second thing I want you to keep in, your, in the forefront of your mind and just tonight, I want you to think of a broken relationship in your life Mom, dad, brother, sister, husband, wife, ex-husband, ex-wife, children, teacher, pastor, church member, friend, whatever it may be. And I want you to think to yourself how much you want that relationship restored, even if you're the one at fault. So I want you to keep those two things in the forefront of your mind tonight. Can we do that? Let's pray and get started. Father, thank you so much for sending your only son to die for us. Father, help us to be a people that live radically because of that fact. We care so much about the physical whether we're eating paleo or keto or this calorie intake or whether we went to the gym in the morning if it doesn't happen in the morning, it doesn't happen and we care so much about our physical appearance sitting in front of the mirror and whether or not every single strand of hair is in place. Father, help us as a church family care more about our spiritual lives than our physical lives. Shift this type of thinking in our minds. Father, please be with this church family. Bless this church family. Father, if there is one person here that does not understand the cross, by the power of your Holy Spirit's conviction, 
allow them the opportunity to believe and repent. And Father, if there is someone in here that thought of that broken relationship, allow them the mental fortitude tonight to repent, take responsibility, show regret, and come up with a remedy in your name. Amen. The title of my message tonight is called Moon Stood Stock Still. Kind of sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, doesn't it? My three-year-old, her favorite book right now is Fox and Socks. All right. If Sue sews, Sue Socks, who sews, Sue Socks, right? Moon stood stock still. And if you stay with me, I guarantee you, you will understand why it's titled that at the end. My message is going to be divided into four acts, almost like a play. We just talked act one through. In act number two, we're going to be looking at Genesis 37. So if you would like to turn in your Bibles there or look at your phones or whatever device you have, I know we put it on the screen, but listen, if you have it sitting in front of you, it is way better, way better. So in act number two, we're going to be in Genesis 37. In act number three, we're going to be in Joshua 10. So if you'd like to thumbnail that in your Bible. Then for the fourth act, we're going to do something that I love, and that's take communion together. Take communion together as a church family. So go to Genesis 37 in Scripture, and and this is what we're going to do. I recently read a book. It was called Visionary Marriage, and I had every intention of reading this book with improving myself for my wife. But when I got to chapters three, four, somewhere right in that, my mind shifted and I started seeing everything that she needed to work on. I started highlighting things that Ashley needs to get better at. And when I got done with the book, I walked up to her and I said, hey, you need to read this. Have you ever done that? Come on now. Some of you are doing it right now. You're like the the shoulder jab, right? Hey, you need to pay attention. Is this right? Listen to a podcast, you share it on someone's social media, you're like, hey, you need to listen to that. We're not going to do that tonight. We're going to read scripture introspectively. We're going to focus on our hearts, our souls, and what we need to do to get better. What I need to do to get better, what you need to do to get better. So Genesis 37 And we're going to pick up with a character named Joseph. You guys know the story of Joseph? Yeah? As a church last summer, we went through the book of Genesis. So the story of Joseph should be familiar to us all. And Joseph is introduced in chapter 37. And the rest of Genesis up to chapter 50 is all about the life of Joseph except for one chapter. And we're not going to look at the life of Joseph. We're going to look at the life of one of his older brothers, Judah. And we're going to notice four things from Judah, for you note takers, four things that Judah had to go through to fix the broken relationship he had with his brother. We're going to actually walk through eight chapters in Genesis. I'm going to paraphrase most of it, but I'm going to point out some key verses that I'd like you to see tonight in the life of Judah. So story picks up with Joseph. Joseph is Jacob's favorite, favorite son. He gets Joseph a snazzy coat. Can you imagine Joseph walking in, strutting his stuff with that fancy coat on? Brothers don't like it. Joseph has this dream where these these bushels of grain are out in the field and all of them bow down to his bushel, a.k.a. his brothers. And then Joseph tells his brothers about it. Weirdo. Wouldn't you keep that to yourself? Right? 
He has another dream where the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, a.k.a. his mom, dad, and 11 brothers, bow down to him. And he tells them his brothers hate him. Hate him. So you know the story. His, the brothers concoct a plan to kill Joseph as he starts approaching while they're working in the field. But then one brother speaks up. And in Genesis 37, verse 26, the brother that spoke up, Judah, says this. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, which <laughs> this would hurt him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. Judah is the snivy dude that concocts the whole plan to sell his brother into slavery. He's the one that maniacally came up with it all and then manipulated his brothers into doing it. It was all Judah. So they sell him into slavery, and chapter 37 ends with Joseph getting to Potiphar's house. But then the next chapter is bizarre. And listen, if you have elementary age kids in here, and you don't want them to hear stuff like this, it's very elementary age inappropriate, what we're about to talk about. There's an amazing kid center over there. You can check them in right there, okay? But in chapter 38, Judah... In the midst of this story about Genesis, all last 13 books of the Bible, it's like God takes a break in the story of Joseph and points out a story about Judah after he sells him into slavery. In chapter 38, which is the most bizarre chapter in all of Scripture, Judah has two sons, Ur and Onan. Ur marries a girl named Tamar. Ur dies. So in Israelite culture, the next brother would marry the widow. So Onan marries Tamar begrudgingly. And scripture says that Onan wouldn't impregnate Tamar. Wouldn't do it. So what does God do? Kills him. Kills him. Now his next brother was way too young to marry Tamar, so Judah makes a deal with Tamar. When my next son, Shelah, gets of age, you can marry him. But Judah forgets the deal. And Tamar takes matters into her own hands. She knows that Judah walks this one path. She knows that Judah forgot about the deal. So Tamar puts uh, uh, this Incredible dress on, covers herself with a veil, and pretends to be a prostitute to seduce her father-in-law. In chapter 38, verse 18, oh sorry, verse 16 first, then we'll get into verse 18. Judah's walking down this path, and he stopped and propositioned her, and he said, let me have sex with you. He said, not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law. So in verse 18, that like uh, Tamar pretending to be a prostitute, right? Judah doesn't have anything to pay, with, uh, pay her with. So she's like, uh, you got to pay if you want this, right? So uh, he's like, I don't have anything. I got to go back home. I could pay you with that. So he promises her a goat, but he rem she remembers, right? She remembers that he's not good at keeping deals. So she makes him give him something, her something. And in verse 18, this is what scripture says. Um, uh, Judah says, what kind of guarantee do you want? And Tamar answered, leave me your identification seal and its cord and the walking stick you are carrying. So Judah gave them to her. Then he had intercourse with her and she became pregnant. I told you, this chapter is bizarre. Later on, village catch word that Tamar's pregnant. How dare she, Judah says. 
Judah demands that she's burned at the stake. And then in the midst of Judah condemning her, she pulls out those identifications that Judah gave her. And in verse 26 of 38, Judah recognized them immediately and said, she is more righteous than I am because I didn't arrange for her to, be, to marry my son, Sheila. And Judah never slept with Tamar again. And then the story picks up with Joseph. Why on earth would God put this bizarre chapter right in the middle of, of Joseph's story? I'm convinced for one reason. And it's the first thing that we need to realize in the process of restoration and broken relationships in our lives. This one chapter exists to show us that Judah repented. Repented. God broke Judah. God humbled Judah. Can you imagine the embarrassment of impregnating your, daughter, your daughter-in-law? Can you imagine, like, like if they got word of Tamar's pregnancy, imagine what the town was talking about after that. Right? God needed to bring Judah to repentance. We need to be brought to repentance. That is the very first step in restoring relationships that are broken in our lives. We must repent. I must repent. I must be broke. Then what comes next? Story skips back to Joseph. He's in Potiphar's house. He gets propositioned by Potiphar's wife. Joseph denies her. Joseph says in verse number nine, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Man, I could sit there and preach that all day long, right? If only we had the thinking Oh, I, I, I don't care if, if husband's going to catch me. I don't care if wife's going to catch me. I don't care if, if this church member's going to catch me. I care what God thinks. Man, if, if we could only just do that, I'm not going to stay there. The, I, could, I could preach that all night. So because of this, Joseph gets thrown into prison. Of course, who's Potiphar going to believe? His wife or Joseph, right? Wife says Joseph raped her. Joseph goes to prison. So Joseph's sitting in prison. In chapter 40, Joseph interprets two dreams, one for a baker, one for a cupbearer. Tells the cupbearer that he's going to go back to the court of Pharaoh and be restored. Tells the baker that it's, you know, don't ask, right? It's it's kaputs for him. Ask the cupbearer for one thing. Tell Pharaoh about me and get me out of prison. If I help you, get me out of here. Cupbearer forgets about him. Two years go by. Two years. And Pharaoh starts having dreams in chapter 41. Pharaoh has these crazy dreams and no one can interpret them. Cupbearer remembers, wait a minute, I know a guy. Right, I know a guy. So he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. Joseph gets sprung from prison, interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Hey, you're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. You guys still with me? You know this story, right? So Pharaoh makes Joseph second in command of all of Egypt to collect during the seven years of plenty and then distribute during the seven years of famine. And in 42, Joseph's brothers realize they're going to starve because it's the seven years of famine. And Jacob has a little bit of PTSD. He does not want Benjamin to go because he remembers what happened with Joseph and Benjamin's his new favorite son 
So in 42, verse 4, Scripture says, Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, go with them for fear some harm might come to him. So the brothers go without Benjamin. Joseph sees his brother. He actually arrests them and puts them in prison for three days. Probably just having a little fun with them, right? I mean, come on, wouldn't you? He really wants to see Benjamin, his younger brother. So he says, hey, I'm going to keep Simeon in prison. And you guys are going to go home with a little bit of food. And tell your father that I want to see Benjamin. So bring Benjamin back with him. But remember, Jacob doesn't want Benjamin to go for fear harm would come to him. So the brothers are like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? They get back. Jacob says no at first, but then they end up running out of that little bit of food. So the brothers say, we got to do something about this. And Judah initiates step number two. Step number two. In chapter 43... Verse 8, Judah said to his father, send the boy with me. Verse number 9, I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. Then let me bear the blame forever. After you're broken and drawn to repentance, you must, in your broken relationship, take responsibility we live in this world where all of our problems are because of somebody else can I tell you something River Church your problem is your fault you must take responsibility you must own it if you hurt own it and fix it After God has broken you, don't blame anyone else besides you. Something happened in Judah. He takes responsibility for his brother. And then in chapter 44, oh sorry, at the end of 43, the brothers get back to Egypt. Jacob finally agrees to let Benjamin go. Joseph finally sees Benjamin. He does this crazy thing. They sit down for dinner and and he sits them in order of birth. Could you imagine being a brother and this is no coinky dink, right? Then he sends him home with food, but wants to test his brothers, wants to see something. So he devises this plan to put his silver cup, his own personal silver cup, in Benjamin's bag of food on his animal. Scripture says in chapter 44, verse 2, Then put my silver cup at the top of the youngest brother's sack along with the money for his grain. And the brothers start leaving town. And the guards catch up to him because Joseph sends them after the brothers. They say, wait a minute, we didn't steal nothing. You can can check our bags. All right, check our bags. They even say in 44.9, if you find his cup with any of us, let that man die. And the rest of us, my Lord, will be your slaves. So the guards start opening up sacks of food and they get to Benjamin's sack and there right on top is sitting Joseph, second in command of Egypt, Joseph's cup. Can you imagine what Judah felt in this moment? Can you imagine the choice that he's going to have to make Because he knew the consequence. Verse 13 says, When the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Man, that was a long walk. A real long walk for Judah. 
And on that walk, Judah commences step number three of restoring broken relationships. It says in verse 16, Oh my Lord, what can we say? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. Judah shows regret. Regret. After you're repentant and take responsibility, River Church, you must show some type of regret for what you've done. You need to be hurt by it. You need to be hurt so bad by it and so ashamed of it that you never want to do it again. He shows regret. And then they get back to, jo- they get back to Joseph. And the most amazing thing happens to Judah. In verse 18, scripture says, Then Judah stepped forward and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant just say one thing. And this is what Judah says in verse 30. Knowing that he was going to be facing serious consequences for his brother and taking responsibility for him, he says, And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. My Lord, I guaranteed my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. In verse 33, is so amazing. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. Judah offers a remedy. He offers a solution to finally seal the restoration process. What what happened to this man where in chapter 37, he was willing to kill one brother and then his other blood brother, eight chapters later, was willing to sacrifice himself for a brother. You saw the process. He was broke by God. He was repentant. He never slept with Tamar again. He turned from his sin, never to do it again. He took responsibility. He showed regret. And then he offered a remedy. He offered a solution to the problem. And then in chapter 45, when Joseph sees this change in Judah... Scripture says, then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after that, they began talking freely with him. That's forgiveness. He saw the change in his brother. And it stirred his soul to forgive them. He saw the repentance He saw the responsibility. He saw the the regret. And then Judah even gives him a remedy. Man, if you want to fix a broken relationship in your life, there's an exact how to at the end of Genesis. So we have the information, right? But we're really good at doing nothing with the information. It's called performance gap. You know what you do, or you know what to do, but you don't do it. I know I should go to the gym, but I don't. I know I shouldn't eat that donut, but I do. 
information is useless without application. Useless. So act number three. Your call to action. What are you going to do with that information? In Joshua 10, Joshua just had moved into the promised land with the Israelites and they were conquering everybody. Remember, Moses couldn't go in, so Joshua took over. And they were conquering all of these cities and they had a lot of momentum going. I mean, a lot of mojo. But the daylight was running out. And they didn't want, they didn't want this momentum to, to go to the wayside. So in chapter, or in chapter 10, verse 12, Joshua says this. On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites... Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon. It's a pretty audacious request. And the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. The sun stayed in the middle of the sky, and it did not set as on a normal day. It's almost like God gave the nation of Israel an extra day here. Kind of like today, February 29th, day 366. Leap year. One extra day to do what you need to do to defeat enemies. To conquer things in your life that you need to conquer. In one translation... Scripture reads this. The day God gave the Amorites up to Israel, Joseph spoke to God. With all Israel listening, he said, stop, son, over Gibeon. Halt, moon, over Ajalon Valley. And sun stopped. Moon stood stock. Still, until he defeated his enemies. Isn't scripture so amazing? This word is so alive and so powerful. It speaks to our souls. It knows our thoughts and intentions. It knows that on this moon stood stood still stock day that you need to fix that relationship that there's no more waiting day 366 in the year 2020 is your day to conquer so what are you going to do your call to action with your moon stood Stock still day. I'm going to give you an opportunity to take that first step, that repentant step this evening. Because we're going to take communion together. And in act number four, here on February 29th, you're going to get a chance to examine yourself. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. And get ready to pass the elements. The band's going to come out. And they're going to sing a song. Before we start passing, I'd like to read you one more passage of scripture. In 1 Corinthians 11, God gives us instructions for the Lord's Supper. 
And this is what God's word says. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. Man, that's powerful, right? Paul's passing on what he received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering what he did right there. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes you're keeping it in the forefront of your mind letting it motivate you to do what's right and then God warns us River Church he says so anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord that is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and have some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. We're gonna take the elements together at the end. Our ushers are gonna graciously pass them out to you. You're gonna get both elements, keep them in your hands. And I'm gonna ask you to do this while we wait for everybody to get it. Examine yourself. Do you need to show repentance tonight? Do you need to take responsibility? Do you need to show regret? and offer a remedy. Talk to your heavenly Father and examine yourself before we take these.